This was 2.30 a.m. this morning. This is the future state of the motion picture industry. Fifty-fifty by 2020 to get women to get the bigger budgets as well. It's very important that we put the stories in the hands of the people who own those stories. Welcome back, everyone. To begin our next session, we would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. The TIFF Doc Conference program is made possible through the generous sponsorship of Showtime Documentary Films. We are kicking off the last section of the day with a conversation with a couple of people making waves in doc curation, Abby Sun and Ashley Clark. Abby Sun is a freelance programmer who currently works as a consultant for True Falls Film Fest and as a programmer for Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. She is also the senior editor at Nat Brut, a journal of art and literature dedicated to advancing inclusivity in all creative fields. She holds a bachelor's degree in visual and environmental studies from Harvard. Ashley Clark is a senior repertory and specialty film programmer at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, BAM, and is on the selection committee for BAM Cinema Fest. He has curated film series at the MoMA, at TIFF Bell Lightbox, for the British Film Institute, and for True False Film Fest, and is the author of the 2015 book, Facing Blackness, Media and Minstrelsy, in Spike Lee's Bamboozled. And I will be moderating this panel. I am the TIFF Docs Programming Associate and Programmer of the Doc Conference. I'm also the Senior Director of Impact Distribution at the Social Impact Agency Picture Motion, leading the non-theatrical distribution team. I'm also a board member of the Brown Girls Doc Mafia, BGDM, a collective that amplifies the work and work lives of women and non-binary people of color working across the doc industry. Uh, join me in welcoming Ashley and Abby to the stage. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, I'll start off with a question that was alluded to by an audience member at the end of the last session. Programming and curation can seem like such an opaque process to filmmakers and other members of the industry. So it would be great if you could start by talking about the parameters of your roles, the structure of your programming teams, and perhaps an overview on how you make decisions as a team. Yeah, I mean, it's a good Good question. When I speak to relatives at Christmas and Thanksgiving and they ask what I do, <laughs> I just say I pick the films and, and leave, leave <laughs> you it You watch at, movies all day. Leave it at that. But, yeah. um, so I'm the, my title is Senior Repertory and Specialty Film Programmer at B BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is uh, New York's oldest performing arts venue. Uh, 1861, I believe it opened. Um, so it does opera, dance, theater, music. We also have four screens. Mm -hmm. um, three, we, you know, three of those screens, 75% of the space is dedicated to first run. Uh, my territory, the remaining 25% um, is um, what we call repertory and specialty. So that's uh, curated film seasons, um, director retrospectives, themed work, special events. Um, and I'm also on the selection committee with three colleagues uh, for our annual film festival, BAM Cinema Fest, which mm -hmm. takes place in June um, and is dedicated to uh, New York premieres of American independent film. So we really kind of start that programming process at Sundance in January and we deadline in April and we present the, the program in June. Um, and we don't tend, to, you know, we could come to this in, in more detail in a minute, but we don't tend to demarcate between fiction and nonfiction for the BAM Cinema Fest slate. And we have a, we do have a documentary shorts program and a fiction shorts program. But in terms of the main slate, mm -hmm. which is around about 25 titles, um, you know, this year we had, I think, 11 nonfiction films. Uh, and last year we had 12. We didn't demarcate them as such. We just, we're at liberty. Um, it's something I feel very fortunate about to just present them together, not in any sidebars. So we'll have films kind of coming together and creating interesting uh, resonances. 
Um, in terms of my team, there's the Associate Vice President of Film, who oversees the whole thing, um, operationally and creatively. I'm in charge of um, the, the programming of the rep side of things. I have another colleague who does that with me, and we have a department coordinator, and then also somebody who does marketing, somebody who does publicity, and then a liaison between mm -hmm. our office and the projection booth. And then obviously downstairs, we have the, the cinema floor staff. So it's, there's a lot of things happening, and we're just trying to keep, keep every communication is really important, and just making sure that everybody knows what knows what's what, and that because we like to do kind of ambitious programming, the first program I did in October 2017 when I first got the job was dedicated to um, the, the cinema around the thinking of Franz Fanon. Hmm. So you can't just put that out there. You have to sit down and have conversations with marketing and publicity to ensure that they have the, the language and the toolkit to um, communicate the work properly, to kind of take your programming into the world. So that's a kind of compressed version of a very uh, complicated and interesting job <laughs> that I'm very fortunate to have. Great, yeah. So for me, um, I do not work in a year-round space like Ash does, um, but very much admire what the entire team's been doing at BAM under Gina Duncan. Um, so for me, yeah, so uh, for the two festivals that I've worked for, so True False Film Fest, where I was a staff programmer for the last three years before transitioning into a consulting role, um, and now I'm um, a programmer for Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival, like Danae said in the intro. Um, and the two structures were really different. Um, I think those um, in the audience who work as festival programmers know that the hierarchy at these places can be really um, in variance. So for instance, at True False, um, the programming team was quite egalitarian there. there. I was one of four programmers, and we programmed by consensus, um, no matter what your job title was. So it was sort of shared responsibility between the festival artistic directors um, and the staff programmers, where everybody would be soliciting films going to festivals, different festivals to scout for films. Um, I sort of took it upon myself there to kind of be the coordinator of the submissions process, um, which can be quite different um, at festivals. And I think right now there's kind of this trend towards using um, the submissions pool as a way to find quote unquote new voices, which I'm actually personally very skeptical about. We can get to that in a moment. Um, Say more. <laughs> yeah, um, about the pay to play system that we all work in. Mm -hmm. um, but for Hot Springs, I think it's actually quite a more, um, that structure I think is a lot more common um, in the film festival landscape, especially in the US, because there's not a lot of um, federal support for um, film festivals for that are nonprofits, um, like the two that I work for. Um, so there, all of the programmers, um, where I am, again, a team of four, but there's a very strict hierarchy there. There's the director of programming, um, Jesse Fairbanks, who's also here at TIFF. There's me, and then there's two um, assistant programmers. And um, there, the, I'm a contract, independent contractor, um, like at many other um, festivals that cannot afford um, to have a year-round staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I work completely remotely. And essentially, you know, it's just, um, in many senses, it is as a glorified screener. You're double checking um, what comes out of the screening committee, um, making some solicitations, but kind of the overall visioning and everything is, you know, I can give input into it, but it's explicitly kind of quote unquote, out of my lane, to be interested in some of the things that Ash outlined, like the marketing, the publicity, the floor staff, um, what it means to be you know, working in the community that I'm working in when I don't live in that community, for instance. Um, and all of those things are things that I had access to at True Falls. Um, not only because I currently still live in Columbia, Missouri, but because that's my hometown and I grew up there and a lot of my colleagues that worked in the education department, um, you know, on the operations side and sponsorship, for instance, in terms of, you know, getting community organizations involved. Um, they were not only my colleagues, but a lot of times they were my former classmates in high school, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, so it can, yeah, it can vary really widely and Got it. And do you want to dig into submissions processes and your, <laughs> both of your thoughts on those at your institutions? Well, you guys don't have a submissions we, we process don't, for BAM Cinema. Fest. I mean, we, we do open, you know, we do, we do have a submissions process and we hire, you know, we had, I think, three screeners this year for, for shorts. Mm -hmm. But broadly speaking, it's an invite only kind of thing. 
Mm -hmm. um, so we're fortunately exempt from some, not that I can't have an opinion, of course, on the <laughs> politics of this, but in, in my specific case, it's, it's not something that really applies to us. You know, we don't charge submissions. We welcome, you know, and some, some blind submissions we, we did screen this year, you know, and we, we received a film called Delo Mio by a filmmaker called Diana Peralta, mm. which we ended up giving a world premiere to and closing the festival with, and that just landed in our inbox one day. So these wonderful things can happen. Um, but broadly speaking, we, you know, we're not kind of part of that general conversation. Yeah, okay, so I guess since I brought it up myself, I, you know, uh, owe everyone the responsibility <laughs> of, of tackling this. Um, <laughs> so, um, so both True Falls and Hot Springs, for instance, are, um, do have open call submissions. Um, True Falls this year is, is kind of, well, True Falls has always been kind of a very unique festival in that every filmmaker that submits um, through, through that system, um, which includes you know, an early and regular deadline and submission fees and all of that, um, do get a personalized rejection letter. Um, and it's kind of the festival's way of answering um, because every programmer that, that works there still currently um, is a filmmaker themselves. And it's sort of the festival's way of answering um, kind of, I guess the question that I always hear from filmmakers, like did the festival actually watch my film? Um, and things like that. Um, and so it's not like criticism that the festival gives back, but it's, it's like one or two sentences saying this is what we liked or admired or saw that the film was trying to do, just to give someone a sense. And, as someone that was training the screening committee, um, so it is the screening committee, for instance, that does um, help us write all of that, um, not programmers watching every single thing. Um, and that kind of is a little bit the source of where all of this comes from, because kind of the submissions-based system, to me, is a way of outlining rules for all of the filmmakers. It's a way for the festival to say, this is how you can get your film to our eyes. This is how you can enter our consciousness about like knowing that the film exists. Because, for instance, a festival like BAM Cinema Fest, which I admire so much, and like all other invite-only festivals, and also you know regular cinema year-round programming, um, which I've also done special projects for, um, really kind of take film festivals as the gatekeeper, um, other film festivals mm -hmm. going to them. That's why you know, we're all here at TIFF. Um, and that can be to filmmakers seem like a really opaque process in terms of getting into the top tier mm -hmm. film festivals where there are marketplaces, where there are industry gatekeepers. So submissions um, have been touted as kind of the solution to that for emerging filmmakers, especially regional film, uh, festivals or specialty festivals. Um, and to me, it really hides a lot of the story. First of all, the issue of the submissions fees. Um, as someone who um, does still currently make films, it's like this enormous paradox that the more experienced you are as a filmmaker and the more money that you have in order to gain networks, the less you pay to submit to film <laughs> festivals. Um, that, you know, and then, and a lot of times, like established filmmakers don't actually, I've discovered this, don't even realize how their films actually get submitted to film festivals. If you have, for instance, a sales agent or a producer who's well connected, or, you know, someone on the advisory board of a film festival, it can just be sent directly to a programmer. Mm -hmm. um, and this leads to a lot of confusion I find about like screening fees. For instance, the convention that film festivals um, do pay screening fees a lot of times to um, films that are quote unquote solicited um, by the programming staff um, or are deemed somehow um, in the solicited category mm -hmm. and do not um, at a lot of festivals, and so this is doubly a paradox, um, actually pay the filmmakers that paid the festivals um, for the content that um, makes up the film festival. Right. And so to me, in the US, um, I mean, festivals, a lot of time what happens to the submission fees is because they need a year-round source of income in order to continue to pay the bills. And that's why festivals economically just cannot get rid of the submission fees. Um, so, but, so filmmakers need the festivals and the festivals need the film. And to me, it's just a way of kind of hiding the fact that there are no rules. 
it's kind of setting aside or putting into open view the sense that there is this egalitarian system when there maybe necessarily isn't. And is there something that you are trying to do to change? <laughs> Abby, can you fix it right now? <laughs> it could be an in-progress plan. It could be a completed plan to have this egalitarian system that we hope for. <laughs> it's a hard question, I know. Um, so where I am personally, I mean, and so that's, that's just like kind of from the filmmaker's perspective too in terms of mm -hmm. submissions. Also as a programmer, it's, in my opinion, and this is not criticizing any festival, it's just how it works. In my opinion, it's a completely disgusting way to watch and consider films because I talk to all of my colleagues and like for festivals, programmers watch anywhere from like 200 to like 800 feature films mm -hmm. per festival. And Danae, I know you've been through this yourself. Um, I've talked to many <laughs> programmers who tell me stories about crying, um, you know, laying in bed, like watching screeners because we don't have enough time to watch all of them. And I know I'm really sorry to any filmmakers in the audience. We know it's a terrible way <laughs> to watch your films, but there's just simply not not enough time in the day I have to like make my meal while I'm watching your film otherwise I'm just never going to watch it so what can you do often you're just not in a in an open qualitative space when there is a, such volume mm -hmm. to consume and I think that is related to how we live now <laughs> generally you know that it's, yeah. it's all connected to waking up in the morning taking out your phone and checking your emails and being in a crisis before you even got into bed. Mm -hmm. I got out of bed, excuse me. Um, so I think part of it, if egalitarian, is, is a more general sense of how, how we prioritize things, how we manage our time. Mm -hmm. That sounds very woolly, but I think it's working out how to deal with, with volume while still being able to bring yourself, your, your critical faculties, your empathy and sensitivity to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer for that, but it's, you know, and I'm also in a, in a fairly fortunate position in terms of the, the control that I have over what I get to program. Um, but I think it's almost a philosophical shift that, that maybe needs to, people need to consider industry-wide. Right, yeah. And thinking about philosophies, obviously we've, we've just talked about how programming is impacted by so many factors and so many points of view. Can you talk about the difference you see between endorsing a film and programming it, and particularly content that you might feel is problematic for one reason or the other? Um, I think in terms of programming or curation, you simply need to be able to stand behind, or stand next to the filmmaker. You know, you can't put a film on, stick them up for a Q&A, and then hide in the wings <laughs> while the audience is asking them what the hell they were thinking. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to be able to, to stand there with them. And when it comes to more problematic content, um, so to speak, um, it's about how you present the work. You know, I, I screened a film once in London called Goodbye Uncle Tom, which is probably one of the most objectionable pieces of work ever created, mm -hmm. made, in, um, made under the auspices of Papa Doc Duvalier's uh, regime in Haiti used um, extras that were just plucked from the streets. Mm. It's this kind of very strange pseudo documentary about two Italian journalists who travel back in time to discover the economic roots of slavery. It's almost impossible to watch, but I think it actually gets to the heart of the economic roots of, of slavery in a way that very few films even try to. So I thought it was worth presenting, but to do that, you need to contextualize, and that goes back to what, what I was speaking about before, working very closely with people who are working in your communications team to make sure the language is accurate, make sure you are bringing in people to contextualize the work, and you're, you're having a panel or an introduction, and you're allowing audience a right of reply, and that you're not opening up yourself to criticism, that you were, you were being thoughtless. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really important to to make a point of not leaving things to chance and being very explicit about why you're contextualizing, why you're presenting something, how you're contextualizing it, and why you think, as a piece of art, it is worth um, opening yourself up to that criticism for. Great. I think it's also a little bit, um, in the festival landscape, there are some additional considerations to that, too. I think working in year round spaces, um, I think very rarely, um, 
not really, but I think it's I think it's more understood perhaps that like series are part of kind of the overall work of the institution that's presenting it. Sure. Um, whereas when you're working for a festival, for instance, that is not only a one-off ex a event that is like the culmin supposedly the culmination not supposedly it is the culmination of many months of work by the entire team and it's a festival and so it's meant to be something that's celebratory for all of the filmmakers that participate it's supposed to be festive it's supposed to be um, this thing um, that is if you work for a festival that um, presents itself this way is supposed to be a site of discovery um, for the attendees. And I think that brings a different set of dynamics to, um, to programming decisions um, that you know, even with you know, introductions that contextualize the screening, even with, um, for instance, you know, counter-programming, maybe a short that addresses some of the flaws that the programming team sees within the film, whether it's a lack of perspective or maybe in the documentary space, something about the ethics of how it was made or, um, you know, something about um, the subject matter explicitly. Um, it can be really difficult, I think, within a festival space to make that clear when audiences don't necessarily stay for the Q&A because they're you know, rushing off to go to the next screening, when the program notes so often, and this is something that I think we need to be reconsidering, the program notes for festivals are like so laudatory towards everything. Because well, they're, they're geared towards sales. You know? Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, obvious, it's often advertorial copy. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. and. Um, and that's because, like right now, filmmakers, you know, expect the support of festivals in that way, um, which I think does lead to some really interesting situations when the filmmakers kind of are able to leverage that support of a festival mm -hmm. to criticize the institution within those spaces. Um, that, to me, has been sort of where the most interesting work can be done, where it's one filmmaker that's already been accepted into the institution. So uh, this is really vague, so I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, the Flaherty Seminar changed their logo um, last year, and this was after kind of mass, uh, they were criticized really heavily for um, the 2017 programmer Nuno Lisboa um, programming Dominic Gangyong's Of the North, which um, since I'm in Canada, I'm going to assume that most of the audience knows about this film, and it's, okay, doesn't... Maybe maybe give an overview, just in case. Okay, so um, Dominic Gangyong is a Montreal, um, I don't know, artist provocateur, filmmaker who is known in the documentary world for making a series of YouTube ethnographies, because I guess his eyesight is failing, so he doesn't like leaving his house. Um, YouTube ethnographies, it's his term. Um, and um, he wanted to, he was, he's, he makes films that criticize the, um, um, the genre of ethno ethnographic documentaries. And um, a few years ago, he, I guess, was very interested in criticizing this idea of self-representation and of collaborative filmmaking that is um, so buzzy right now in the industry. So what he did was he went onto YouTube and I guess he searched Inuit um, is how he made the film, and he kind of pulled clips from YouTube um, that had that search term um, that he said were um, all made by Inuit, or uploaded by Inuit um, youth, mostly, um, and he strung that all together into a film. Um, he called it Of the North, a direct reference to Nanook of the North, and um, the images, the videos themselves were mostly of people being uh, drunk and doing, like, petty crime, like, shoplifting and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was premiered at RIDM in Montreal, um, where, yeah, the film was heavily criticized um, for many reasons. First of all, the soundtrack of the film was um, Tanya Tarek. Uh, Tagak? Ta yes, mm -hmm. um, and he hadn't asked for her permission um, to <laughs> use any of that. He also Bad told news. the festival, yeah, that um, he had asked for, he had notified everyone whose videos he had appropriated mm -hmm. um, for the film. It turns out that wasn't true. Um, so he got, you know, mass requests to um, pull their clips from the film, and he continued to show the film, but with black, where people had asked him to not use their clips, and eventually it was like 74 minutes of black. Um, and then um, the next year, um, kind of as an effort to um, 
not fix the situation, but um, RIDM had kind of assembled a series of panels um, inviting indigenous voices to talk about um, indigenous filmmaking, things like that. Um, they were round, the festival was roundly criticized um, within its own spaces at this, these panels, um, and it did lead to the entire programming team, including Charlotte Selb, who had since left RIDM, um, writing a letter saying that they um, apologized for programming the film because it um, uh, portrayed racist and colonialist stereotypes of indigenous um, people, uh, First Nations people, and Inuit people in Canada. Mm -hmm. So it was after that, two years after all of that happened, that the Flaherty programmed um, this film, or the programmer of the Flaherty programmed the film, and there was a series of weirdness there that I don't quite understand. Um, and so they were roundly criticized, not only for the fact that Robert Flaherty and Anuka the North, sorry, this is getting really long. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the, the last year, 2018 um, Flaherty seminar, the, one of the invited presenting filmmakers was Guy Hopinka, um, and he objected to, as a presenting filmmaker, sitting under the Flaherty banner um, at every post-screening discussion. Um, because what was on that banner was kind of the silhouette of Nanook, um, like harpooning a fish or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, he, like before arriving, sent an email to the Flaherty board and to the programmer saying, I refuse to sit under this banner. And that, I know that the board had been talking about changing the logo for many years, but that was the catalytic event, was one filmmaker saying no. Mm -hmm. and they took the banner down that very Flaherty seminar. Wow. I'd love to hear from you both what you think the most urgent challenges are in doc programming, particularly in North America where you both work. Um, and can you talk about how you fit into finding solutions? You can see I'm obviously looking to you to solve all challenges. <laughs> hmm. Urgent is a big word. Urgent. Um, I would, you know, as a recovering film critic, um, I, I'm really um, invested in the idea of improving how nonfiction is written about. I still think there's a pervasive sense that documentary needs to do a certain number of things, otherwise it's failed. Mm -hmm. It needs to educate, it needs to be journalistically sound. Uh, and I think that uh, writers, like someone like Eric Hines, who many people in the audience will know, um, who spent the last few years doing a wonderful column called Make It Real, a uh, film comment magazine. I think the majority of it is archived online, so I'd recommend you check that out. Um, I just think, not, again, not isolating from film and documentary film from, from politics or from what's happening, but developing a language to understand that all art is inherently political. Every, we're just having a conversation about repurposing images of, of death and violence you know, in, in the back. That's very urgent. You know, the idea of, there was a film that won Tribeca, um, a love song for Latasha, I think, which was a wonderful film that um, uh, makes a very strong statement in not, d deliberately not showing um, the uh, VHS footage of, of the young girl being shot in the head um, in LA in the, in the 91 over a dispute over paying for some orange soda. Mm -hmm. The film uses kind of VHS aesthetics and uses a lot of different techniques, animation and so on. When it comes to the point that this, this catalytic um, event is cited, it deliberately doesn't use it. Right. And it really forces you to think about how many films, uh, fiction and non-fiction, that we've watched where without, without any warning whatsoever, you're, what, you're looking at a lynched body or you're, looking, uh, you're, you're in the gym, you're, you're watching the news and, somebody, and, and without warning, you're watching a cop killing a person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is incredibly urgent, and that ties into the idea of being able to, to write and critique better, to have a firmer, for, for critics and people writing about nonfiction, to have a firmer grounding in, um, in politics and what is actually happening in society, to connect it all together, mm -hmm. and to understand that these, none of these things operate in a vacuum, mm -hmm. but yet they're, they're all connected. Again, that sounds a little woolly, but I, I think that's something that I'm always thinking about. And that's as a programmer as well. How do we connect uh, the programs to what's happening in the world in a way that's not didactic or, or too on the nose, but really shows that we are engaged with, with what's happening. Mm -hmm. And are there any particular critics or publications that you think are getting it right, mostly right? 
Um, I always enjoy reading uh, Filmmaker magazine. I think uh, Vadim is a very Vadim Rizov is a very kind of exacting um, critic of fiction and non-fiction alike. Um, I mentioned uh, Eric. Um, help me out. Erica here. Balsam. Yes, Erica Balsam is, is wonderful. Yeah, an, an American critic based in in London, teaching over there. Um, who else is good? You're good. Yeah, she's good. Ash is great. Um, <laughs> um, other, other critics. I mean, I, to me, what's really important, um, going off of what Ash said about, for instance, like how images of dead bodies are used in this, um, I think it's a really important um, conversation in media and journalism right now, too, especially with, um, for instance, the image that, the associated press image that was all over newspapers this summer of the father and his dead daughter mm -hmm. drowned crossing the Rio and how that was used, um, you know, in, in a way, all of these newspapers in New York Times, you know, Wall Street Journal, all of these places used this image um, because they wanted to inspire empathy. Mm -hmm. And Teju Cole um, in the New York Times, again, like an artist and a writer critiquing the own institution in which he works, um, wrote actually a really, like I think the most prominent of the critiques against that urge um, to show traumatic images, I think partially because it doesn't consider who's looking at them. If it's someone, for instance, like you know the lynching, if it's someone who faces a risk of being lynched in the US still this day, looking at that image, I mean, it, it can be quite traumatic mm -hmm. and it's trafficking on images of death in ways that I think are quite problematic. To me, also, as someone that works in communities that are majority white, although they are not as white as the audiences at the festivals make them seem, um, I think it's also really important not to, I think a lot of this urge, like Ash said, to educate, um, well, yeah, really and, and, comes, yeah. And to assuage the white liberal conscience. Exactly. As, as, as if it's that's like the default, which I'm not interested activism. in. Yeah. Like we cannot make, we cannot allow audiences to go see a film and think that they've become better people through that act. And that they don't have to do anything after that. And yes. sometimes the, the extremity of the images and the sensory shock of that will fool somebody into thinking that by absorbing it, that mm -hmm. they've done something mm -hmm. and that their work is, is in processing that image. Yeah. which is obviously not good enough. Right. And it's about developing the language and the communication skills to, for us as people who are often called upon to explain these things, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we don't have to do that. Yeah, and then when somebody does explain something like that, I think a lot of festivals and institutions are, to their credit, I think looking for younger, more diverse voices. I, I don't know why I said younger, um, that was ageist. Um, <laughs> Like looking for maybe underrepresented voices to be a part of the gatekeeping process, to be a part of the programming team or part of the education team. And I think that oftentimes um, what I hear from colleagues and from friends um, is that when these sorts of objections are brought up, um, sometimes they're dismissed because, um, you know, there's, there's all of these... Uh, arguments for why things are the way that they are, for instance, mm -hmm. that the film that might be problematic to someone should be programmed anyway because it helps illuminate an issue or maybe it gives voice to an underrepresented um, group of people that it depicts or, um, you know, for instance, that we need to privilege programming documentaries that are in the English language because more people go and watch them. I think those are all really dangerous assumptions to make, first of all, and I think they also reinscribe, um, you know, the cultural imperialism of the U.S. that's led us to this situation in the first place. Um, so, yeah, in terms of solving it, what are we doing to solve it? I mean, I think it... I think we just solved it, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Success. Yeah, I mean, I think it means being really brave. I think it means doing programs like what BAM is doing that are like the Garrett Bradley's like America program where you're doing something, you're showing the same film like 10 bajillion times, um, but doing it in such incredible ways. Yeah, I could talk about that very, very briefly. There's, there's an amazing film called America by Garrett Bradley, who's a great artist and filmmaker. She has a piece in the Whitney Biennial, the controversial, mm. the, the, the latest controversial Yeah, I was going to say, which, one, which controversial yeah. Biennial? Um, so she's made a, a short film, 30 Minutes, which uh, well premiered at Sundance in January, which is kind of a, it's, it's kind of a dance, evoc uh, impressionistic film, black and white, set in New Orleans, which kind of imagines what black 
film, what black life on film could have looked like were it not for the effects of something like Birth of a Nation in 1915, mm -hmm. which came along and kind of forever altered the representation of black people on film. And, and that representation spilled out into politics and legislation and everything. It was extremely influential. But I was thinking, well, how do, how do we play this? I don't just want to put it on once or bury it in a shorts program. So I decided to build a program around it. So screen it seven consecutive days, each time with a different complementary component. So we have like Judy Dash coming in um, and it will screen with two of her short films and Garrett and Judy will be in conversation. Great. Um, it will screen with Hale County this morning, this evening. So there's a kind of historical continuum because both, both of these films, Garrett's and Ramel's film, uh, use uh, archival footage um, from a film called Lime Kiln Club Field Day mm. from 1913, which is one of, if not the earliest known black cast feature film, which was discovered in the MoMA vaults. They pieced it together and re-released it in, or released it, excuse me, in 2014. Wow. And, and, both, uh, and one of the aims of the curators at MoMA, Ron and Raj, was to get young black artists to engage with this, this material and recontextualize it. So anyway, and, and that's just a, a way of, I'm very, again, fortunate with my platform that I'm able to conceptualize and execute ambitious programs like that. But the aim of it is to actually present a historical continuum and bring in people who can, are able to talk, speak authoritatively to the history, the politics of the image, uh, and not just say, here's the film, enjoy it, good night. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important every step for me as a curator to make sure that how we present is integral to it. And that is that extends to the fact that we are uh, the community around BAM. You know, it's a, it's a rapidly gentrifying area. We have a responsibility to reach out to the community that is being displaced and make sure that they have a stake in what we do as well. Right. And that, is, that, that involves how we present, who we bring in, how we work with our education and community department, and all of these things. So it, it's a very um, complex job, and, a, and, a, and a, th there's many kind of notes you need to hit. But for me, all of it comes down to just your overall philosophy of making sure that you're um, responsive. It's a weird mixture of proactive and reactive, mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the challenge that I enjoy. Yeah, right. And I think a lot of times, too, as a programmer in the middle of the country where we think we have a sense of like what the audience is and what the audience needs, um, to me, I think a lot of it really means thinking hard about the role of the institution yeah. and really trying to um, change its relationship to the community, not necessarily thinking of it in an educational capacity, but as something that, so I, I mean, I guess to make it like more clear. So. I think a lot of times in documentary issues, issue-based films are how we think about the films that are programmed, that um, this issue is important to the community or this issue is important in order to be a well-informed person living in the world, so that's why the film should be programmed. And I think that can lead to, first of all, I mean, that's a very authoritative stance um, to take in terms of being a steward of content that is shown to a community. Um, and then, you know, if we maintain that authoritative stance, what does it mean about the people that are making these decisions? Um, because as a film programmer, like very few of us I have found are trained in, for instance, political science or, you know, activist work or anything like that. And just because someone's trained in that, does that give them the authority to make those decisions? Um, so I think a lot of times, like, when we're making those decisions, it's it's just so tough. It's like it's, the decisions can't come just from like one person or one team making this, the decisions in terms of what is being shown. That's like a really no matter how many diverse programmers you have on mm -hmm. your team, no matter how diverse your films are, it's like really difficult to make this kind of systemic change it's if you think depends, of it in that way. It depends on kind of where you're at, but I think yeah. if you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you can try and create a culture Ex yeah. in which you're able to have these discussions, mm -hmm. that it's not, you don't feel uncomfortable to raise an issue because right. it is all essential. The, the ethics uh, and, and the politics of representation are present in every single conversation that you have. And if you're able to create a culture wherein that is the standard, um, it's, it's incredibly helpful and liberating. Yeah. Right. And I, oh, I was going to say, I'd love to be able to get in a question or two from the audience, if there are any. There are a few. Uh, yet in the center. 
You, you're wearing brown, I believe. <laughs> Hi, um, can you guys, can we listen to you speak every morning and then also, <laughs> in all seriousness, I would. I need it. Uh, thank you so much. And also, also in all seriousness, is anyone in Toronto working with either of you to bring you here to do programming in this city? Oh, I will say there are great um, programmers and critics in Toronto. And to add to the list of names, Sarah Ty Black. Um, Sarah Ty Black is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Lydia Ogwang and um, Jesse Cumming, who writes mm -hmm. Cinemascope and does yeah. work at Wavelengths. Um, Adam Neyman's a great critic as well. Um, yeah, there's great, great, great stuff happening up yeah. here. Blake <laughs> Williams is doing really wonderful things in yeah. the experimental sphere and writes for Filmmaker, yeah. uh, another magazine. Yeah, all of these names are coming to us finally when we're... Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so, uh, thank sorry, you for that, Lisa. Sorry to yeah, but please um, still invite but, them I back. I mean, I guess to me that's very <laughs> flattering, but I guess kind of my response to that is, um, I think that, you know, movements have to be developed organically. Um, so I guess I'd be really interested in hearing about you since you, uh, Ash, since you're not, you know... Yeah, I did, I was here in 2017 yeah. um, to do Black Star. Um, which was an extension of something that I did at the BFI in London in 2016 and then took to MoMA in New York. So that was the last time I think I programmed anything here, but mm -hmm. I, w I would love to come back. I have an email, I have a cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> but there's um, amazing people working in Toronto yeah. and, you know... And it's great that we get to come here yeah, and talk about this. Yeah, exactly. Really and happy. so... Thank you. Thank you, Danae. Um, but, I mean, I think it's, it can be tough because I think a lot of people... Um, again, like depending on the institution that we're working with, um, have different abilities to create space within that institution. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be really yeah. difficult for certain people to, I'm not naming any, this is completely general, I'm not subtweeting anyone. Yeah. Um, it's like, it can be, like as a person working, that doesn't, I have authority and power, but a lot of times for me, like using it, it I have to consider like what sort of soft power do I want to exercise? If for instance, I see a film that is problematic, do I just you know, give it a low score and try to bury it within the submission system in hopes that nobody else on the programming team ever sees it? Um, You're and weighing up your own emotional labor as well. <laughs> How much am I gonna get out of this conversation if I really delve into it in earnest? Exactly. Which is a difficult, you know, it's a constant negotiation when you're a minority in a majority white space, you know. Yeah. I should really underline uh, Gina Duncan, who you brought up by name earlier, I should have done at the start, um, is Associate Vice President of Film at BAM. I'm very fortunate to have a, a black woman as a boss who has incredible vision mm -hmm. and gives me the space to kind of do the programming that I do. And th I'm able to have those conversations wi with Gina and with my team because of her, because of her laying those foundations. And I think it's important to have leadership with vision and people with executive power who use it wisely. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. I know we could chat all day with you too. And that's why I'm so grateful that you're here. Ashley and Abby, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hello again. <laughs> um, to begin our next session, we would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas 